Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this full CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also, remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about SD Access, which is part of Cisco's digital network architecture. Before you can understand why we have SD Access and the benefits that it brings, you need to understand the traditional way of securing access to the network. So the traditional way to control access to and traffic flows within a network is with fixed VLANs, IP addresses, and access control lists. Users are expected to always connect to the same physical port where they're assigned an access VLAN and IP subnet. So if a user is in department A, they're expected to plug into a switch port which is being configured with the department A access VLAN. They then get assigned an IP address based on that. If a user is in department B, they're always expected to plug in a switch port, which is being configured with the department B access VLAN, and they then get the department B subnet based on that. We then have access control lists that control the traffic flows between the different IP subnets. Now, that configuration can get complex, and because each device is configured individually, it's more work to configure it and more likely to have errors. It also does not support user mobility because users are always expected to plug into a physical switch port for their particular group. It means if they plug in somewhere else, the solution is really not going to work. So looking at SD access now, it's a newer method of network access control, which solves those limitations of the traditional implementation. Traffic flow security is based on user identity rather than the physical port that the user is plugged into. And users can log in from and move to any physical location in the network. Two components are required for SD access. That is the ICE Identity Services Engine. That is Cisco's AAA server and it authenticates the user. The security policy, which controls permitted and denied communication between groups, is configured on the DNA center. So the ICE and the DNA center are integrated and work together to provide this solution. SD Access uses an underlay and overlay network. An underlay network is the underlying physical network for the solution. It provides the underlying physical connections, which the overlay network is built on top of. And an overlay network is a logical topology used to virtually connect devices. It is built over the top of the physical underlay. So the combination of underlay and overlay forms the SD Access network fabric. So looking at this, you can see here is our physical topology here. So this is the physical underlay. Now, with this diagram, I've just connected the switches like this, that's got no particular meaning. So for the actual way that you're going to connect your devices, just do that according to the standard best practice. I've just drawn it like this because it's an easy way to show an underlay network. The way that this is laid out, the topology is not specific to SD access. Just do it the way that you would do normally. Okay, so we've got our underlying physical network with those physical connections between the devices. And then for our overlay network, so for the actual connectivity between devices, that uses a tunnel built over the underlying network. So we've got a virtual tunnel that's part of our overlay, which provides the virtual connectivity. When SD Access is deployed into an existing brownfield network, any configuration can be used for the underlying physical network. So if you've got an existing site and then you want to implement SD Access there, it means that you don't need to rip up your, your settings you have already and start again. Whatever settings, whatever configuration you've got on the device will still work with SD Access. So links between the devices can be layer two or layer three and any routing protocol can be used. So your existing setup will work just fine. DNA Center can also be used to automate, to automatically provision the underlay network in new greenfield sites. So if you do have a brand new network that is just being physically deployed, 
you can use DNA Center to do the initial setup for you to support SD access. In that case, layer three links will be used between the devices and ISIS is used as the routing protocol. The reason that ISIS is used is it's very extensible. It's easy to add additional functionality onto there. So that is why Cisco chose that as the routing protocol. Now don't worry for the CCNA exam, you don't need to know anything about ISIS. You'll learn about that if you go onto the CCNP. Okay, so on our overlay network, for the control plane, we use Lisp for that. For the data plane, it's using VXLAN. Cisco TrustSec, CTS, is used for the policy. So we've got those three different technologies there. Each of those technologies has been optimized, extra features added to it for SD access. So let's have a look in some more detail about Lisp, VXLAN, and TrustSec. So starting with Lisp. Lisp has been around actually for quite a long time. There's a good chance you haven't heard of it before because it wasn't really implemented that widely. The original behind Lisp was to support mobility. So if you had users that were moving physical location, it meant that they could take a virtual IP address with them. So because we want that with SD access, we want to have the mobility. Cisco, rather than coming up with a brand new protocol, they used Lisp and they added some extra bells and whistles onto it to make it perfect for SD access. So let's have a look at the way that Lisp is going to work. So the, the tags here in yellow, that, that is making up our physical underlay there. We've got an edge node switch with IP address 10.10.10.1 over here on the left. And we've got some edge node switches over on the right, 10.10.10.2 and 10.10.10.3. And one of our switches is going to be designated as the control plane node. Actually, you're going to have more than one control plane node for redundancy. So then what happens is we've got a host here, 192.168.1.2. That gets connected to the network. Our edge node switch sees that and it sends an update message to the control plane node saying that 192.168.1.2 can be reached through me. The next thing that happens is our host over here on the left, 192.168.1.1. It sends a packet with a destination address of 192.168.1.2, the host over on the right. That packet will hit its nearest edge node switch, and then that switch will ask the control plane node, how do I get to 192.168.1.2? Well, the control plane node knows because 10.10.10.2 told it earlier. So the control plane node will reply back saying, you can get to it via 10.10.10.2. That edge node will then build a VXLAN tunnel over across to the other edge node and the traffic will be sent through that tunnel. So you can see we've got our underlying physical network underlay and then we've got our VXLAN tunnels for the data plane in the overlay network. Okay, so that is a simplified view of how Lisp works to build the control plane, to build the connectivity between our devices. Let's have a look at how mobility works now. So let's say that 192.168.1.2, that user moves down and is now into this switch here. So this would be most likely if they were over wireless, they move to a different location in the network. What happens then is that the new edge node switch will send a message to the control plane saying that 192.168.1.2 is now available through me at 10.10.10.3. The control plane node will then update its database with the new information. It will inform the other edge node over here on the left. And then the VXLAN tunnel will now be built directly between the correct edge nodes. Okay, and finally looking at the policy. Cisco TrustSec CTS is used for this. So the users are authenticated, meaning they put in their username and password, and that is authenticated by the ICE, the Identity Services Engine. The security policy is configured on DNA Center. So ICE and DNA Center work together for this. Users are allocated an SGT, Scalable Group Tag. In some documentation, you'll also see this being referred to as a security group tag. It's the same thing. Cisco TrustSec secures the traffic flows based on the security policy and the SGTs. So for example, a user in department A can get to their servers, but they can't get to other departments. Now, there's a difference with 
it's the axis and the way that the older traditional truss sec work. Because truss sec has also been available for quite a few years. Truss sec is a great idea, but an issue with it that affected it to not have such a widespread implementation was that all the devices in the traffic path had to support truss sec. So that was only on newer model switches that it was originally supported on. But when you use SD axis, that limitation is taken away because SD axis uses those virtual tunnels. The traffic can actually go through any device. It does not have to be an officially supported Cisco TrustSec device. It can even be switches from other vendors. Okay, so that was everything I needed to tell you about SD access. See you in the next lecture for SD WAN. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can click on the link above my head or in the description to enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.